Uh, okay. And I chose this song. Uh, it's, it's sung by Dion Warwick, but it's called Dion Warwick with friends because there are several people who, very famous people who sang the song together. And the name of the song or the title of the song is That's What Friends Are For. And the, this lyrics were very beautiful and it tells a lot about what the friends are for. However, I could not find a Chinese poem that really matches it. So I chose this one, which is Chun Ri Yi Li Bai by Du Fu. It's Du Fu writing about how intensely he remembers and uh, he loved his good friend Li Bai. So this would show what friends feels like to having a friend, what it feels like for you to have a good friend. Uh, though it doesn't say anything about what friends are for. But after that, I'm going to show you many, many of Du Fu's poems about how he remembers and loved Li Bai and wishes that he could uh, see him again. So with many different angles, you will be able to see what friends mean to people. So I thought that would be a good match. And at the same time, I'm going to talk about a lot about the Dubai and the Dufu. How, how, we talk about them separately all the time, but uh, people do not always know uh, how the relationship between the two people was like. And we're going to go into that a little bit. And before that, I'm going to talk about Sashi Tai Ho. And that is because last time we talked about uh, such things. Yeah, we talked about Wu Xu Zhengbian and the boxer. Actually, we started with boxer Re rebellion, which is Yi He Tuan Quan Fei Zhi Luan. And so I thought I would like to talk about Sushi Tai Ho because I have something to say. <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. And today uh, we have a list of vocabulary and uh, they're pretty much uh, uh, standard fare. So we're going to go through them one after another after I talk about a few other things. One is that Wu Qi asked me, why did Mark Twain, I'm sorry, <laughs> spelled it wrong. <laughs> Mark Twain used the word Chinaman because we are all aware that for American people to call Chinese a Chinaman, it's very impolite. Why did Mark Twain do that? He being a very kind and warm person and very much for the, the being, the, the, those people who are disadvantaged. So why would he use the word Chinaman? That's because Chinaman's meaning changed since he died, since he passed away. Uh, a good word, Chinaman, gradually becomes a bad word, Chinaman. And Mark Twain was not aware that sometime in the future, it would become politically incorrect to be calling Chinese Chinaman. Uh, why is that? Uh, why is this word pejorative or derogatory? Uh, these two words both mean the same thing, which is to be uh, uh, put other people down by, by the tone or the words you use when you talk. So how did the Chinaman, the word Chinaman came about? It is just people from China. And the, in the old days, there were hardly any Chinese people in this country. So when someone sees a Chinese people at that time, years ago, they would say, oh, okay, we'll call them Chinaman. So it was tradition to call Chinese people Chinaman for a long time with no pejorative meaning. They used that word because they just thought that's the right word to use. Uh, however, as 
time goes by, people started to feel the, the way to address a Chinese person, China man, seemed rude and crude and pejorative. That's because uh, uh, people often, when they see a Chinese person, that person usually could not speak English well. So we call that kind of English, uh, Pinjin English. And uh, pigeon, P-I-N-G-I-N something, I don't know. Uh, that's called the Pigeon English. And the China man epitomizes this kind of talk. When they say China man, it just sounds like a Chinese was talking. So it becomes gradually uh, a derogative way to, to speak of Chinese. So the Chinese people especially did not like that. They think you should say Chinese instead of being called a Chinaman. Uh, so as a result, the word became more and more contentious and the people just decided, especially Chinese people decided they don't want to be called a Chinaman. So as years go by, people don't call Chinese Chinaman unless they really don't like Chinese and they want to call them Chinaman as a way to put them down. Uh, similarly, there are people who call Japanese people Japanese and the when during the Second World War, lots of people call them Japs. That is a very rude way to, to be calling Japanese people. And uh, we don't recommend you to use that word. But that was also gradually developed uh, way of uh, social thinking. It's not how it started out that way. Uh, and when you're talking about the language Mark Twain uses, of course, he uses the language that was prevalent at that time when he was living. So we naturally would think of the, the other word that he used a lot in, in writing that is nigger. Nowadays, we do not call black people niggers, but when Mark Twain was alive, that's the standard word to use. Uh, of course, gradually over years that word becomes more and more politically incorrect. And nowadays, uh, there was even a lawsuit. So a black person, he opened a dictionary and saw the word nigger and he sues that dictionary publisher saying, when he looked at that word, he felt so bad that he had to sue this dictionary dictionary publisher for printing that word in the dictionary. Of course, I would consider that a frivolous, uh, frivolous uh, lawsuit because you cannot sue a, a dictionary publisher. Uh, let me see, frivolous, uh, frivolous, I guess it's printed. Uh, it's, uh, frivolous is, a, a don't take things seriously. If you bring a lawsuit against a publisher for publishing an entry in the dictionary that's called a nigger. That is, uh, in my opinion, a frivolous lawsuit. Uh, on the other hand, Mark Twain used niggers in his books very, very often. And that's why many people uh, decide that we should ban Mark Twain's books in schools because that word appeared too often in his books. However, these people who did that deliberately to avoid the reason, the real reason behind uh, their wish to ban Mark Twain's book. They did not want children to read Mark Twain's book because he advocates uh, abolition, that is to abolish slavery in America. Uh, so by reading his book, you would get his opinion that 
slavery was a bad thing. That's why those people who wanted to ban Mark Twain's book really wanted to ban, ban Mark Twain's books because uh, his message is slavery is bad, not that he uses the word nigger. So it was just an excuse for them to ban Mark Twain's book because it has the words nigger too often. Okay, so, so this is just another word I thought about when we talk about Chinaman, how Mark Twain used the word Chinaman uh, when he did, he had no bad feelings or no, n not a shred of arrogance against the Chinese people. It's just that people were using the word Chinaman and he used the word nigger to, to describe black people, not because he disliked them or ha had content for them. It's just because everyone uses that word in the past. Uh, that brings me up to another point. When we say something, it was a good word until it, we, we use it too much. Then we decided that's not good enough. We wanna change it. And then we use a new word for a long time. And the, one day we decided that's a bad word. Then we want to change it. For example, Negro. Negro is a word for niggers. Negro is simply a word about black. So in Latin, you call something black. You call a tree or a rock or a flower, whatever that is black. You would say Negro. And when it's a female, you would say Negra. So if you go, uh, take a look of many Latin names of plants or animals, you would find this word all the time, negro or nigra, depending on whether this is a flower or a tiger or whatever. So that's just a Latin word. And uh, thousands of years ago, that word was there already. Uh, it has no bad meaning at all. But when people use Negro or nigger to call black people after several decades, people think mm, that's not a good word. So they decided we should not use those words. And they decided to do what? They called black people black because that's kind of neutral. It's black, okay? But after we use the word for a while with black meaning the black people, then black people thought that's not a good word. They should not be calling us black. So they decided to call African-American. So every time a word, which is totally a neutral word, got used many, many times, then people feel that's not a good word and they want to change. And after a while, the new name they decided is not good enough. It's because there's racism in this country and each neutral war, word after a while carry that racist term, feeling or attitude. So it, it's no longer a good word. So people will have to change words all the time in search of a better word. But you cannot blame a people in the past for using the wrong word because in, during that time, it's not a wrong word, okay? So that's all I want to say. Let's just start with the little, little vocabulary. The first one is naturalize. Uh, if you don't know it, then it seems naturalize is to make something natural. You would never have imagined that naturalize means for a person from a different country to be naturalized, to be the citizen of this other country that he was not born in, that's called a naturalize. So in Chinese, we call that gui hua or shi ru guo qi, which both means a person uh, went through the process of naturalization, that's a legal process, and uh, obtaining the citizenship of a new country. In this case, we we are all naturalized as American citizens. I would say probably 
over 90% of the people who are in the class. So this is the legal word naturalized. Huh? And when you have this process, which was not quite natural, I would say, when you have this legal process, then there are complications because there are people who say from China who became a United States citizen, then both country would wonder, is he still the citizen of China or is he also a student in United States or both or no longer a Chinese citizen? These are the questions that naturally uh, arises from this process. And there are ways that some country takes steps to clarify this issue. Uh, in some country, when a person uh, is naturalized to become the citizen of another country, then the original country wants this person to renounce his previous citizenship. So here I have a slide that has a word renounce uh, in red color highlighted. So to counter multiple citizenship, there are people or countries that allow multiple citizenship. Uh, for example, many of us were from Taiwan and we have dual citizenship. Uh, neither country, I mean, neither Taiwan nor United States objects to the fact that this person has two different citizenship. So that's fine. But in there, I think in Israel, they also can, uh, uh, they also allow people to have dual citizenship, but some countries do not. I think in mainland China, they decide that if you want to be and the citizen of America, then you have to renounce your Chinese citizenship. Uh, so that's a requirement. So if you run for uh, an office or you're hired as a teacher or whatever, you have to declare that you renounced your American citizenship in order for you to uh, be hired as a Chinese citizen. That, that is what I heard, but I could be wrong. Uh, however, this legal process of renouncing one's uh, naturalization, uh, renounce the, the previous citizenship, it is of dubious um, merit because the, it may be the law for you to do that, but nobody's going around checking whether everyone who has dual citizenship, huh? dual means the two, huh? dual, okay. Uh, there are very few people who go around uh, checking people's uh, renunciation of their citizenship. So uh, the whether the law of one country requiring you to renounce your previous citizenship is, uh, it's important to the other country. The other country may not care at all. So they, they don't ask you to renounce your past citizenship. So this slide is about renouncing naturalization, uh, whether this renunciation actually causes loss of original citizenship or not is uh, questionable, okay? Uh, however, the word naturalized has a different use that is much, much more natural, which is naturalize the plants. If you have a plant, most often it's a beautiful uh, flower, and you instead of planting it in the flower bed or planting in the flower pot and put it in the house, you plant it in the wild, okay? And you plant a lot of them in the woods or, or uh, on the meadow and places like that. So when people come, they would see lots of beautiful flowers here and there. This process is called naturalized. 
uh, naturalization of plants. That means instead of planting you uh, planting a plant as an adorable object somewhere, you do it scattered about in the wild so that it becomes part of the pasture, part of the natural beauty that is called naturalization of plants. Uh, there are many flowers that that are already naturalized. These flowers are called indigenous. Indigenous means it was naturally born in this country. You go to Mount Rainier or you, you go to wherever in the wild, in the uh, state park or whatever, and all those flowers you see everywhere, those are, they, they should be indigenous flowers. Uh, here I have flora and a fauna. That, the, those are two words that came together all the time. Flora means plants and the fauna means animals. So when you say the flora and the fauna of, say, Puerto Rico, then you mean all the naturally born creature on the, that particular island. So when we talk about the geography, we often talk about the country's flora and the fauna. Uh, these, both of these words are plural. That, that means flora means all kinds of flowers. And indigenous means they were there for a long, long time. They were not planted there. So when we say naturalize, uh, a certain kind of plant, for example, lilies or daffodil or whatever, if you bring it from outside and plant it everywhere so that it becomes naturalized, these plants were not indigenous. They were introduced or they were foreign and they could be harmful to the ecosystem. Okay, so I want to show you some uh, some pictures of plants that were naturalized, and these are pictures I took in London, Kew Garden, on June twenty eighth, twenty thirteen, and you see that uh, English gardens are famous for their being natural looking. If you go to a garden in France, you would see trees all pruned into cones or flat or rounded or whatever. That's the French way of having a garden, but the English way is let them look natural. So you look at this Kew Garden, the meadows in Kew Garden, and you see lots of white and the purple flowers uh, popping up everywhere. That's because they deliberately planted that thing there. Uh, so it would look like they were indigenous, but they were not indigenous, okay? And does anybody know what those flowers are? They are called the trembe. Ah, just a trembe, pipa called the trembe. Okay, so when you go closer, you see naturalized fritillaria, trembe. Uh, in this country, when they are sowed in, the nursery, they are called the checkered lily because they look like Bai He Hua and they've got little checkerboard pattern on it. So it's called checkered lily because if you go closer, you can see these purple ones are in the checkered pattern. And those that are white, of course, you cannot see the checker. So they're called the checker lilies. And they can also be called the snake head fritillary. Uh, fritillary means trembe, and the fritillaria is the Latin word for it. Uh, when you make a, a plant name Latin, you usually add IA at the end. So when fritillary was changed, it becomes a fritillaria. Uh, if you go to Kew Garden, make sure to look for this. Uh, in my garden, I planted this kind of flower and they usually bloom 
in May, but this picture I took in uh, in June. So it bloomed in June as well. And I could show you more pictures I took in August. They were also there. So I don't know why my only, my checker lily blooming in May only, but uh, in Kew Garden, every time I was there, it was there. I mean, they were there all, all the time, at least in June, July, August. So I don't know why. Okay, that's a mystery. But if you go to the nursery here to buy a fritillaria or fritillary, they would look like this. Okay, that's what people in this country think Trumbay looks like. So this kind of checker lily is a kind of exotic one and it's rarely seen in nursery. Okay. Hey, Joe, this yes. be, so this trumpet is the similar the one we eat the uh, yeah, yeah. yeah, I should have uh, showed you a picture. Uh, it's our trumpet, the, the kind that we use as an a medicinal herb is similar to this checker lily, but still smaller. The flower is smaller and the color is less, less pretty than this, but it's, uh, you know, this one definitely is too flashy, too, too, too much of a riot. Very, very uh, bold in color and uh, weird in shape, but the, the trumpet we have is more similar, but in a very subdued way. And I should make a point of finding a, a picture uh, for you next time. Does it have any kind of fragrance? Uh, not that I know of. I never try to smell it. <laughs> <laughs> How about tulip? Do, you, do you find tulip fragrance? I don't know. No, not at all. Well, <laughs> I guess I not, say. yeah. I not assume. much. Not fragrant, no. Mm. But since we all know the name Tran Bay, I thought I would like to show you some pictures just to widen your horizon. Okay. The next word is revoke. Uh, last week, uh, last week we talked about the Yong Wing, Rong Hong. His citizenship was revoked. That is to uh, You can have a driver's license revoked. For example, if you uh, don't pay your fines or if you uh, were driving, you were caught driving under the influence, that, that can be a reason for you, your license to be revoked. And something else can be revoked, it's a treaty. Uh, for example, we had a treaty, in, for example, the Paris Treaty about environment, uh, global warming and Trump came along and along with that Iran, Iran treaty. He revoked both treaties because he was a president. And when he's gone, uh, Biden came along and he would try to bring us back into those treaties. Uh, so this word revoke is about treaties, permits, license, citizenship, and things like that. The next thing I promise to talk about is <laughs> the word regent means shi uh, means that you had a king or an emperor or somebody who's on top who is somehow incapacitated. Uh, uh, this would mean I would borrow this place. <laughs> Uh, if you're going to talk about something, please mute your uh, Zoom because the other people will not be able to hear you. Thank you. And I was going to talk about something. <laughs> uh, I forgot. Okay. I was talking about uh, a king or an emperor who was incapacitated, okay? Incapacitated, okay. Well, usually a 
a pro, uh, okay, so this has nothing to do with the first part. Uh, capable is a word that means you can do it. Uh -huh. You have a great capability to do something, or this room uh, has a full capacity of 100 people. That's what capable or capability or capacity means. So when a, pers when a person is incapacitated, that means somehow he became unable to uh, function to performance in his function as the leader of the country. So for example, <clears throat> uh, King George III, he became cra crazy. Uh, what can they do? They, they uh, announced that his son, King George IV, becomes a regent to do the job he is doing. Uh, so so King, King George IV becomes a regent. However, after a couple of years, uh, King George III became cured. He's no longer crazy. So he became the king again and his son is no longer the regent. That's a good example to explain what a regent is about. And the English monarchy having a, a prominent uh, uh, history, uh, such things would naturally have happened before, as I mentioned in this example of King George III. King George III, was a crazy king. If you have seen the musical Hamilton, he was the king in Hamilton. He acted very weirdly. And he also mentioned that people later think he was crazy and so on. And he was the king when uh, on the throne of uh, England, when America had the revolution and started uh, uh, the independence process and it became a different country. So uh, it's kind of weird to think a king during that important time went crazy, but he did, yeah. Uh, but later somehow he became cured. So if you have seen a movie or the play called uh, uh, The Madness of King George III, uh, you would uh, have more idea about what it was all about. Uh, incidentally, when the movie The Madness of King George III came to United States to be shown as a movie, they decided to change the name because they think people being so ignorant about English history, they would think that the movie about the madness of King George III is a sequel and they, the American stupid people would look around to see the prequels and the sequels of this movie about King George III, which is really a joke, I think. Anyway, so I've seen both that movie and the play and the uh, and Hamilton, of course. Uh, I highly, highly recommend Hamilton, which is an excellent, excellent show. And uh, now that it, it no longer costs you a thousand dollars to watch it. Make sure you watch it. And uh, you better watch it more than once because they speak so fast. You have to pause it all the time. I mean, I have to pause it all the time. And I've watched it three times so far because it's so brilliantly written. Okay, and uh, it was written and acted by Lin, Man Lin Manuel, Manuel Miranda. Yeah, that's his name. He's Puerto Rican. Okay, let's talk about uh, Cixi Taiho. Uh, she became a regent uh, after her husband died. Her husband, meaning the emperor, Emperor Xianfeng died, but Xianfeng is really not her husband. Xianfeng is 
the emperor with many, many wives. So, and she was one of them. She was only a concubine, which means, uh, let me put it here. Huh? We, we, we talked about that word. When you talk about Chinese, you would come across this word quite often, concubine. A concubine is a wife of a husband who is not the formal former formal wife is not the legally the wife but it's uh, on the side one of the many other con concubines uh, so she was a concubine and she was uh, taken by the emperor to be one of the concubines when she was a teenager. And as soon as she gave birth to a child who is in this picture, Tong Zhi, huh, who later became the emperor after, she's, uh, after Xianfeng died. And uh, this is Tong Zhi. Huh? Uh, when we look at these two pictures, you have probably seen Cixi in the picture on, on the left or some other version that are very similar to it. And we look at that, we say, what an ugly woman. But I recently got hold of the picture on the right and you could see she was once a very pretty woman when she was young. And this is a rare picture when she was 20 something, maybe 30. And uh, it was a rare picture I got from somebody's line post re very recently, like two weeks ago or something uh, from a, a classmate of mine. So that was a picture in 1862. And uh, I would venture to guess that that pre pretty picture was censored by, by many governments or many leaders, many regimes since then because that shows her in a very good light. It shows her seem to be very pretty, uh, behaved with good upbringing and so on. No, they don't want you to know that. They want you to believe that she was an old hag who is uh, very uh, weird and uh, conservative and uh, didn't want to change uh, resists uh, reformation. So they always show him, her in the ugly and old, a picture of where she was ugly and old. Uh, let me see. Let's talk about this picture on the right. And uh, this uh, son of hers was on the throne for one year. He ascended the throne in 1861 and he was there. He died at age 19. So he was only briefly uh, a little more than 10 years on the throne. And uh, when he first came to be the emperor in 1861, Cixi was a, a regent for this emperor who was a kid. Uh, when we say one of the regents, because there was another one who was the, the formal wife, the empress at the time, uh, Xianfeng's wife, Ci An Taiho. Ci An and Ci Xi both acted as regent for the young emperor Tong Zhi. And this picture shows them with another American lady who is Alice, the daughter of Theodore Roosevelt. Theodore Roosevelt is the uncle of FDR, the, which means Franklin Delano Roosevelt. So there were two Roosevelt presidents in America. And uh, this Alice on the left-hand side is the daughter of the older Roosevelt, as in Chinese we would say Lao Luo Sifu and the Xiao Luo Sifu. Huh. Okay, so they had the picture taken uh, with this very elegant uh, region 
who was the Empress Dowager Cixi. Huh? We talked about the Empress Dowager last time. And this work, this title is called Empress Dowager Cixi. Huh? Right now we're all using a Chinese Han Yu Pinyin, so we try to spell it the the mainland way, which is C I X I. C means C, so it's a C, and the X means uh, Xi, so it's Xi Ha. So it can easily be spelled with four letters C I X I, which means C Xi, and in our old way of spelling, it'll be much, much longer. And the she is a tai ho, which means that uh, from the level generation, when you talk about generation, she was older, one generation older than the emperor. So she is a tai ho. Uh, at the same time, you have Zan tai ho, who is also in the same generation because they are they actually sisters-in-law, if you can say that, actually, they're not sisters-in-law. They have the same husband, so they're not sisters-in-law. Okay, so you talk about Cixi Tai Ho. Nowadays, you would spell it as C-I-X-I, and you would call the title an Empress Dowager. And Cixi also has this same title, and together they became the regent when their husband died. Okay, so we have Cixi Taiho who was born in 1835 and died in 1908. He, uh, she was a regent when, uh, uh, who, okay. He was a regent and at the, in the position of a regent and the afterwards when the emperor became, actually ascended the, cro the, the throne, that she was in effectively in control of Chinese government in the late Qing dynasty for 47 years. So you talk about stability in power, that, that is quite a long time for a person to be in power for 47 years. It is from 1861 until her death in 1908. That's a very long reign. Selected as a concubine of the Xianfeng Emperor in her adolescence. Adolescence means a probably teenager, huh? Nian Qing the Shaho. We say uh, before you mature into an adult, which in this country we consider 18 years old, is when you become an adult. So adolescence would be before 18, but it was not a child. I mean, being an adolescent is not being a child. So it's probably the, the time you were a teenager is a time of your adolescence. Uh, she gave birth to a son, Zai Chun, in 1856. So according to this, Zai Chun was born in 56 and ascended the throne. Let me put that down too. Ascend, which means rise up to, to the throne. That means to 登基变成国王, huh? So this Tongzhi, he was born in uh, 80, uh, 50, 1856 and he became uh, the emperor in 61. So he was probably six years old, give and take one or two years. Uh, so he was very young and he could not handle the job. So he, he had two empresses, dowager, who conducted business behind a curtain. Trillian uh, Tingzhen. That's how it was. After Xianfeng Emperor's death in 1861, the young boy became Tongzhi Emperor, and she, meaning Cixi, became 
the Empress Dowager. Uh, she was not meant to be the, the regent. Uh, Emperor Xianfeng deliberately ordered that the person to become the regent should be certain people, but not Cixi. But she somehow very, very, uh, how do you say, cunningly manipulated the situation and ousted all those people, a group of regents appointed by the late emperor. And she assumed the regency. Uh, so this sentence says, she ousted, she ousted a group of regents, uh, the Xianfeng emperor appointed a group of regents to, to help the future emperor uh, to be functioning as a leader or the ruler. However, Cixi very cunningly, which means very uh, as we would call, a fox is the cunning fox, huh? Uh, cunning, and the other word would be manipulate, huh? manipulate. Huh? When we were talking about uh, the puppets, the marionettes, those quaile, huh? We say that these puppets were manipulated by the puppeteer. Huh? They manipulate these puppets. And that is uh, just a straightforward word because puppets are meant to be manipulated. However, people are not meant to be manipulated. So Cixi Taiho was smart enough to manipulate so that she was able to oust the group of regents appointed by the late emperor and became the regents along with Zan Taiho at the same time. So the two of them became good friend, actually, I heard. They were good friend and they uh, very happily did, did that job for many years until Zan died and Zan died before her. Because I wouldn't say because, because she was older, but that's not the reason why a person died. Uh, so she then consolidated control. So after she ousted all these uh, very powerful people, she consolidated control. Huh? Consolidated just,把她的权力,或者她的控制整个都变成很坚固了,OK? Okay? Over the dynasty, when she installed her nephew as the Guangxu Emperor at the death of the Tongzhi Emperor in 1875. So this uh, Tongzhi died, as I mentioned, she, she died at age 19. So if she he was uh, the emperor at age six, then he, he was on the throne for 13 years. And uh, after that, there was no heir apparent because this emperor who just died was 18 and had no heir. And there were many, many nephews that were possibly eligible to be picked as the next emperor. And the Cixi picked Guangxu, who was a nephew of hers, which means that Guangxu is uh, in the same generation as Tongzhi. And uh, of course, he, she picked him for a number of reasons. And one of them is that she was he was pretty young. Xiang Guangxu was much younger than Tongzhi and more controllable. So she could easily uh, be, uh, stay in power for many more years to come. Uh, here's a chart of all these emperors. Uh, they, they're on the list are four emperors of the late Qing dynasty, starting with Xianfeng, Tongzhi, Guangxu, to Xuantong. Okay. The Qing dynasty, there are 10 emperors. And the, the former part of Qing dynasty was very, very strong 
and the many long living emperors held the job for like 60 years, many of them actually. So it was a very strong beginning for that dynasty. Uh, as I showed you before, I could recite to you of emperors of the Qing dynasty, and they are Shunzhi, Kangxi, Yongzheng, Qianlong, Jiaqing, Daoguang, Xianfeng, Tongzhi, Guangxu, Xuantong. I hope I got them all. Okay, so today we're going to talk about Xianfeng, Tongzhi, Guangxu, and Xuantong, and they are all very short lived. This, uh, the first one, Xianfeng, was on the throne for 11 years. Okay, and the Tongzhi was on the throne for 13 years from age six to age 19. And the Guangxu would have lived a long, long time, uh, if not for the fact that he was killed by Cixi Taihou at age, th uh, not age 34. His, the age was uh, 37. Okay. Uh, he died when he was 37 and uh, he was ordered to commit suicide or somebody actually killed him or poisoned him when he was 37 years. And he ascended the throne when he was uh, probably four years. And we say probably because the person can be born on the first day of the year or on the last day of the year. And the, the person could uh, be counting the age, the Chinese way or the Western way. So, so we can all never say uh, as a person is exactly how many uh, years and what happened and so on and so forth, unless we know exactly the dates and we can calculate it ourselves. So he was like three, four years old when he was picked by Cixi to be the emperor. That's Guangxu. Huh? And the Guangxu, uh, of course, when he was four years old, he needed a regent. So Cixi went on to, uh, to act as a regent for many, many years until he probably turned 20 or somewhere around that time. However, uh, in Guangxu 24年, which is uh, 1898, that was the year he met Kang Youwei and Liang Qijiao, and he was just so excited about this uh, reformation. So he, he decided to do this by Ri Weixin, huh? the, uh, how do you say that? Uh, the reformation or the reform, uh, both words can be the noun, huh? reform of a hundred days. He issued hundreds of new policies and the things like that every day, many, many, many every day for uh, 100 days. And it was just unrealistic because you cannot possibly have all those policies carried out with uh, so many old people in position that are against it. Now, he encountered huge resistance from the, all the people already in, in the system. And that Cixi realized that this is going too crazy. So she came around and did the coup d'etat. Coup d'etat. Uh, let me see where I wrote this down. We'll, we'll see that we're a little later. Uh, that is a zheng bian. Huh? So, so Cixi arrested the emperor and put him under house arrest for about 10 years until she was about to die. She knew she was about to die. So she had Guangxu uh, killed so that he could not live after Cixi to carry out what he wanted to do. That's what happened, okay? And of course, after they all died in 1908, we had a new emperor who was the last emperor of the Qing dynasty, Xuantong, and he was three years old or something like that. 
Uh, yeah, I heard he was three years uh, three years old. Uh, or by the year, it could be two, but he was three years old. Anyway, uh, so Pu Yi became the emperor and was uh, the emperor for four years. So you look at this chart, you have era name, which is the name of this ruler, Xianfeng Tongzhi, Guangxi Xuantong. And there's birth and days year. 1831 to 1861. And they were given a name, which in this case, Yi, Yi Zhu, Zai Chun, Zai Tian, Pu Yi. These are their personal names, but they have an era name, which is Xianfeng Tongzhi and so on. And here, uh, this in this col column, you have reign, which means the beginning year and the ending year of the reign uh, of this, excuse me, of the reign of this emperor. So the year that he became the emperor is 1850, and the year he died is 1861. And the years in between, 11 years is the reign in years. Okay, so reign is ta dang chao, ta zuo zhe ge zong, uh, zuo zhe ge uh, huang di, the Shuqi, uh, the reign and the reign in years, a number of years he was in, uh, reigning over the country. Okay, so that's a very handy chart to know all the uh, ins and outs of these last four emperors. Uh, uh, let's continue the story, which is that uh, he supervised the Tongzhi, re Tongzhi restoration. Restoration is a good word, it means. Uh, things were crazy and chaotic until this restoration arrived. Then things began to calm down and uh, prosper. Huh? So Tongzhi was was a period. The reign of Tongzhi was a period that Cixi helped to bring about the restoration, and uh, she institute instituted the moderate reforms that helped this. Uh, country to stabilize and to survive until 1911. The reason I so much want to tell the story of Cixi is because we were probably all cheated by the government. Because we mentioned Cixi, everyone knew that she was uh, crazy, ignorant, and uh, selfish, and uh, power grabbing and uh, uh, thinking about herself, but not the country or not the future of the country. And that is exactly the, the image that Sun Zhongshan, Jiang Zhongzhi, Mao Zedong, they all wanted you to feel. So they try their best to picture, to depict Cixi as the very bad guy. In addition to that, she being a woman. Uh, when people think about a woman being all these bad things as depicted by your government, you naturally would believe. Not that you, you made any conscious de decision about it. You were just told this story again and again and again since you were a child until you are 60 or 70 years old, you never doubted that Cixi was any good, but uh, her reputation was rehabilitated recently in the past maybe 30 years. And uh, they found out that she was smart and very friendly to foreigners and very much into reform in a steady way. And, and she never embezzled the public fund for his, her own pleasure. We, we, we were all told that she took the money meant for building the Navy to build her private garden, Yuan. but that is exactly the opposite because she wanted to build Yuan or to remodel Yuan, but there was no fund. So she, out of her own stipend, 
uh, she gets an annual stipend from the government. She took that out and paid for the restoration of Yihayuan, uh, the summer palace. And uh, uh, your president or your leaders consistently lied to you to say that so he embezzled the public fund to build her private garden. That is not true. There's ample proof that it did not happen. Okay, that's just one of the things you've been cheated. Two, three, 16. Five years ago, I went to the Falkland Islands. And when I got there, there are lots of signs there that says, that they call Falkland Island and with a different name because Falkland Island was a name given to the place by British people. And almost all the people, like 95% of the resident on the island were of British descent. And they all voted that this land should belong to the British Empire or the UK now. But uh, the Argentina, Argentinian government in uh, probably 81, I think, 1981, decided to invade Falkland Island. And to this day, their propaganda is uh, UK illegally invaded their land and they successfully uh, drove them out. Uh, that is the official line of the Argentinian government and they taught their children from age one all the way through college. They were always taught Falkland Island was invaded by the British and uh, they, the, the real patriotic way is to be against the occupation of British Island. And they are the only country in the whole world that taught their citizens this way and continue to do so for all times. And I went there and saw that and I realized the power of the government to brainwash the people. And I look back at my past and I did not like what I experienced. Let's just put it that way. Uh, and the reason that I found out about Sushi in the positive light was because of um, Professor Meyer, Malam Meyer, who came to, to uh, AF, ASCF, Yai in Fatsu, uh, our senior center, and he gave a series of talks. Uh, he talked about uh, Qing Dynasty. He talked about history of Taiwan. Actually, I think he did it over two years. And in that, she, he mentioned how Cixi was rehabilitated in recent decades. And that was the first time I heard about it. And now I believe that this new theory is true because they produced uh, ample evidence. There are lots of uh, historical facts and documentation that shows that. But Sushi being a woman and in as uh, the ruler of the previous dynasty, she was painted as a scapegoat, scapegoat, uh, so that all of us believe she was a bad person and we never got to see a picture of her youth because she was beautiful. Okay, not that being beautiful has anything to do with whether she is good or not, but our deep leaders decided that they should hide that pretty picture from us. It's not because I like it or not. Okay, so she supervised the restoration and the she did not agree to abdicate what I mean is 
she did not agree to have a constitutional uh, monarchy uh, like what they're doing in uh, UK. Uh, uh, that's a, a monarchy th that decided to become to have a constitution. At that time, there were lots of people asking, wanting China to become a con constitutional monarchy, but she resisted at that time. But later, after the Boxer Rebellion, she decided uh, that was the way to go. Okay. So at first, she refused to adopt Western models of government, meaning constitutional monarchy. She supported the technical technological and military reforms and self-strengthening movement. She actually was, uh, she did a lot of reform during her time before Guangxi or during the time Guangxi was a kid, when she was a regent. She did a lot of technological and military reforms against the wishes of many of, his, uh, of her rivals. Uh, uh, I would recommend someone with, with a stamina to read the book by Chang, who, who, what's her first name? Zhang Rong, huh? Zhang Rong, Rong is Bing Ge, Ge, Bing Rong, is uh, her name is, uh, I forgot her English name. Uh, okay, uh, and she wrote a book just on Cixi. So the book is probably just called the Cixi or the Dowager, Empress Dowager Cixi. That was a book <coughs> that listed a lot of, <coughs> oh my God. Let me, once I started coughing, that means I should stop talking. Uh, she supported the 100 days reform of 1898. That is in the beginning when Kang Youwei and the Liang Qichao was, uh, came into the court to help Guangxi making all those uh, reforms. But she feared that this it's too sudden and without support of other officials it would be disruptive and all these are really valid reasons it should be carried out slowly instead of being what Guangxi had it going which was at a very crazy space, uh, pace huh? uh, and she is afraid that Japan and the other foreign powers might take the take advantage of uh, the shakiness of those new policies and uh, invade the country, which is also a very valid uh, uh, worry. So she put Guangxi under house arrest because she believed Guangxi was going to assassinate her. So. She put him in the middle of, uh, I think it's Zhongnan High or some of those highs. There are Bei High, Zhong, Zhongnan High, Shisha High. Uh, there are several lakes uh, near the Forbidden City, and uh, there was one with uh, a tiny island in the middle, and uh, Guangxi was kept there. And that island was or the building was called the Ying Tai, huh? So you have the movie called the Ying Tai Qi Xue Ji. Uh, she publicly executed the main reformers, huh? Uh, there were six main characters of the reform, reform who were executed. They were, their heads were chopped off, but the, the, the most uh, important ones got away, huh? That's Liang Qi Chao and Kang Youwei and the Rong Hong. Uh, that's why we're talking about this today because of Rong Hong. Uh, after the Boxer Rebellion led to invasion by allied armies, so he initially backed the Boxer groups and declared war on the invaders. 
in the beginning, she was for the boxers. She encouraged the boxers' re rebellion. Uh, but then she realized that was a mistake. She uh, actually, after the rebellion, she publicly apologized for doing that, which caused the Baguali and Jinha, the an alliance of eight powerful nations descending on Beijing uh, to revenge on the death of uh, the killing of uh, missionaries and the embassy staff by the boxer uh, uprising. When Cixi returned from Xi'an to Beijing, she became friendly to foreigners in the capital and uh, began to implement fiscal and the institutional reform. So the reforms also concerns fiscal, which means uh, finance and the institutional reforms aimed to turn China into a constitutional monarchy. So she, after the rebellion, she decided to go uh, towards a constitutional monarchy. The death of both Cixi and the Guangxi in November left the court in hands of Manchu conservatives, a child of Pui on the throne, and a restless, deeply divided society. Uh, that's uh, the end of the history, okay? So she was a very important figure at this moment and uh, painted really, really in the bad light by all these uh, upcoming Republican revolutionaries and uh, communist revolutionaries. Uh, together, they think it is a great idea to put all the blame on this poor woman. Uh, so her legacy have been uh, debated for a long time, conventionally meaning that in the past, we usually think we denounce her as a ruthless despot. That means, 传统上我们认为她是一个非常的强暴君, a ruthless despot, a ruthless is a very violent and aggressive, and despot is a leader who is ruthless, uh, whose policies, and we thought that her policies, those, though keep the dynasty going for many years, led to the humiliation and the utter downfall in the Wuchang uprising. Uh, this is the old thinking, how we all thought that was the way. She was a ruthless despot and she caused the humiliation of the country and the downfall of the dynasty. However, there are new thoughts, here we call them the revisionist, the people who has a different way of thinking are called the revisionist. They suggest that nationalist and the communist revolutionaries scapegoated her for deep-rooted problems beyond salvage. Yeah, actually she's got a, a, a land times. It's very difficult for her to prevail, being the ruler. So they made her to shoulder all the blames. Uh, these revisionists thought she was scapegoated, huh? and these revisionists lauded her, uh, if you are a Christian, you would have encountered this word loud many times, laudate, laudate, laudatum, and so on. That means to zemeju, that's a Latin word. Uh, her maintenance of political order, she actually did very well keeping the uh, political balance among the many factions. Uh, faction just a good but on the downpai, huh? Uh, let me find the place to put down this word. Okay. Faction. We can also use the word 
click click。So she kept the、uh, the power balanced and carried out reforms, including、uh, what what are the reforms she also did,、uh, and should the torturous punishment like Lin Chi Ra 什么的，各种惩惩罚哈 ，and the ancient examination system in her ailing years. When she was going to die, she put in place the banishment. I mean, the abolishment of、um, torturous punishment and、uh, the kaju judo.、Uh, these are all the things she did.、Uh, of course, there was a huge resistance among the people under her, but、uh, she was able to carry out something. Huh. Uh, this is all I wanted to say about Cixi, but、uh, I think to some this come as a surprise. That I think you were probably brainwashed, and I believe you probably were. Okay.、Uh, so now we're saying, Dick,、uh, we're progressing along、uh, with the the vocabulary, which is only the beginning of it. <laughs> okay. Decapitate also was introduced when we were talking about Dong Hong. He was almost caught and decapitated,、uh, but he was not.、Uh, but six other people were. I chose to quote them in Chinese because these are all names of people: Kang Guangren, Yang Shenxiu, Yang Rui, Lin Xu, Tan Sitong, Liu Guangdi. These are the six major. People involved in the reform that were captured and decapitated, they were taken to Cai Shikou and decapitated in public after no court procedure. They did not go through any court hearings, and they were simply summarily, summarily decapitated.、Uh, we say summary, summary. Summary was the word, but to become summarily,、uh, when a person is executed summarily, there's no due process, no hearing, no court procedures. Okay, so they died very quickly in the same year. The coup d'état. Here's the word coup d'état, which means 政变哈，戊戌政变 means coup d'état of、uh, 1898 because the year that year was. Called Wu Xu in that year, in Chinese. So this is about decapit decapitate, which I guess you would probably not encounter this wor word in your daily life. I'm sorry, my mouse is acting up.、Uh, you look at the word decapitate. Huh? This is capital, capta. This all means the head.、Huh? Uh, the head of a pillar is called a capital, and the, the capital of the country is called capital because it's a head. And、uh, to chop off the head is to decapitate a person. Okay. And the next word I also have some qualms about. It's the word uprising. Huh? When you say an uprising, you are saying that. A lot of people came up to be against the government, and in the case of boxer, it's not against the government. Actually, the government is for their uprising, which is a weird thing because never in the world anywhere else would you see an uprising the government is for. That is because the boxer uprising is against the foreigners, and Cixi was all for it until much later. Okay, and the, the word would carry a, a meaning. If you, when you describe a certain act, you can call it an uprising, a rebellion, an insurrection, or a mutiny. And each word is different in its connotation. So when you say it's a mutiny, you mean they were wrong. And when you say it's an uprising, then they probably were right. 
but it can be right or wrong. But when you say mutiny or insurrection, you, you, you're judging them. You're thinking that they were wrong. Uh, rebellion is a, a less um, prerogative way to say it, but uprising is the, the, the best way to describe something in a neutral way, okay? So we're talking about uprising, the boxers uprising. Uh, it used to be called the boxers revolution. I think the standard way is to use the word re rebellion. Rebellion, I'm sorry, did I say revolution? No, I was wrong. It was uh, re rebellion was the word. They, they all mean the same thing, but depending on your standpoint, something you are for, it's something you are not. A mutiny is the worst of them because it is about a ship. When you have a ship in the ocean and the people working under the captain decided to oust the captain, that's called a mutiny. And the law is very, very severe against the act of mutiny because this ship is out there with, you cannot just call 911. You cannot get police or army to help you. So they have to write the law so severe that people would not dare to do it. So mutiny is a very strong word, meaning the revolt that is terribly wrong. That's the wrong side to be on. Huh? And in the movies, you have seen Mutiny on the Bounty or the Kane Mutiny. They were both uh, things uh, I was going to say in this country, but no, they're not in this country. The Kane Mutiny was in U US uh, Navy in the, the World War Second, the Second World War II. <laughs> I'm sorry, the Second World War, okay? But mutiny on Bounty happened on the British ship in Tahiti. So it's not in this country, but America produced so many movies that are called Mutiny on the Bounty that you almost think it's an American story, but it's not. Huh? So there are three movies uh, that I know of that were on the in the movie theater instead of just a TV movie or something, huh? The first one is, uh, uh, th there were two major characters. I wrote them here, huh? Captain William Bly and the Fletcher Christian. Uh, so, so these are the two major characters. Of course, Captain was the despotic captain and uh, uh, Fletcher Christian was the uh, the leader of the mutiny. So you have two major characters are very strong and opposite to each other. And being a very big blockbuster movies, every one of them, they have to find very famous stars to play these two roles. And the first one was in 1935, Charles Lawton was Captain Bly and Clark Gable, Clark Gable, that's, the biggest star at the time. Clark Gable was a uh, Christian. And uh, he, uh, I think he was much too old for that role because uh, that leader of mutiny was just about 20 years old. And Clark Gable was Played, played that role much, much later. And then sec second one is 1962. You have Marlon Brando and Trevor Howard. And we have Richard Harris in a subordinate role. So she, he is not one of the two major roles. And of course, Marlon Brando was the famous one, much more famous than Trevor Howard. So his name is in black while others are not. And the next one is Mel Gibson and Anthony Hopkins. And this one has a twist because it depicted them as a homosexual lovers, which I don't know if it's hinted by the book or history or not, but that's how they did it. Uh, Mel Gibson was the, the reigning 
uh, dude <laughs> of the day. Huh? He, he is a nobody right now since he said something bad about the Jewish people. But uh, he, for quite some time, he was a handsome young man, the go-to handsome young man. Okay, so these are the three movies, and uh, the K Mutiny. The, on the left, it's a book. It was written by Herman Wook. I was talking to my, to my sister about Herman Wook the other day, and the, the K Mutiny is a very complicated story about people's psyches. It's during World War II, as in this play, you can see they were wearing contemporary clothes. And this play uh, adapted that novel into a play, and it's only about the hearing, the court martial of K Mutiny hearing. Uh, it does not have the previous part about how the people came to that ship and how they felt when the captain behaved weirdly and how they tried to neutralize uh, this captain and so on. This play is only about the court martial. Huh? The, the so-called court martial is the court, huh? so you have the court, court procedures, uh, not in the civilian court, but in the military set 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 up so this is called the court martial and the third poster on the right is the poster for the movie and you got all these famous peoples Humphrey Bogart, Jose Farrell, Van Johnson and the Fred McMurray and the good man is Fred McMurray and the bad man is Humphrey Bogart who played the uh, the, the weird and the psychotic naval captain who was a uh, who was overthrown when this, these, all the people under him unanimous, unanimously opted to oust him. Okay, uh, let's go to Sepoy. I like, I, the reason I talk about rebellion, uprising and mutiny is because I want to emphasize another thing about brainwashing people. And this is Sepoy mutiny. Uh, when India had a rebellion in 1857 in Sepoy, they call it Sepoy Mutiny. It has nothing to do with the ship or the sea. It's just a group of people conducting an uprising, which the British government condemned. They think these people are bad, bad, bad. So they decided to call, call it Sepoy Mutiny. And the history had it always as sepoy mutiny for many, many years, until now the Indian people decided that it was that their first independence war, they were not mutinying against the, in this case, not even the government. It, they were against the British East India Company, which is a company acting like the government it has all the power of military and uh, diplomacy and everything. This commercial entity, Dong Indu Gongsi, was there to be the boss of all the Indian people. And they dictated everything and they treated the people very, very badly. And the uh, incidents that caused the rebellion was because they, the Indian people working in the factory were either in, in Hindus or Muslims. And one group do not eat beef, one group do not eat pork. And when they process all these products, they had to use their mouth to draw out the uh, bullets out of fat, pork fat or beef fat in order to manufacture this guns and the things like that for the in British company. And they refused to do that because it's against their religion to touch 
with their mouth anything from the pork or the beef. So it happened and the, the British people call it a mutiny because anyone who know this name would know, oh, these are the bad people. They were fighting against our great uh, United Kingdom, but, but they were good people if you were on the other side, okay? So nowadays we no longer call it sepoy mutiny, okay? Uh, so the last bullet says its name is contested because it has always been called the sepoy mutiny, but no longer. Nowadays, when you look into it, people are starting to change it. They would call it sepoy uprising or something more friendly. And because I was going to spend so much time on these things, I knew I had no time for imperialism and colonialism. So maybe some other day. Uh, we continue talking about Boxer Rebellion, and they use the word plunder and condemn. Huh? So, so we had uh, this Bagua uh, Lianjun, the Alliance of for Western Powers, eight nation alliance. They came in because they thought they were so right, their people were being killed. So they came and killed everyone. And uh, they killed a lot of Chinese and they plundered, which means they went about and loot, looted the things that are precious. Also, you have the word plunder, which we usually don't use in our life because this would be a very large scale, usually carried out by the military. Then the condemn is to Qian Zhe. Uh, we use the word condemn quite often right now. Every time the United States decided to sanction a country, they would condemn that country first. It is to say they were wrong, huh? or Wen Sui. Uh, I'm going the wrong way. And here I have uh, uh, Moses with two tablets of stones on which the Ten, Commandment, com, Ten Commandments were carved onto the stone tablets. Uh, uh, the tablets is just a longish rectangular shaped uh, thing made of stone. And uh, it not, does not necessarily have to have word on it. However, Chinese brought this art in, to the next level. So we have exquisitely made stone tablets and those were not called the tablets. They are called the steelies. Huh? If you want to translate any way, any, any words that's about Chinese, uh, say calligraphic steelies, you have to use the word steely. Huh? This is the word and the plural would be stellus or steely. I don't uh, think you would have to do it, but uh, in case you come across the word steely, you will know it means very well done, well carved stone tablets. Okay. And we mentioned this because of the Ark of the Co Covenant that is the box that contains the two stone tablets uh, from uh, Moses. And then I talked about a movie called uh, As Good As It Gets. Uh, it was about an OCD person, uh, obsessive, uh, something. OCD disorder, okay. Just, uh, uh, the, the movie was, uh, it had uh, Jack Nicholson, you know, Jack Nicholson, he's very weird and he hates all the people. And uh, he, uh, he, is a mis uh, he is described as a misanthropic. So this is a word a little hard to pronounce. And the, it means a person who hates human being dislike human being, distrust human being, or has contempt for the human being. Um, 
we translate it to yan shi ha. And uh, the word that is opposite, well, let's read the last line first. Uh, misanthropic is an adjective. If the person who is misanthropic, then we call him a misanthrope or, um, or a misanthropist. Now, this. These are a mouth, mouthful, Buroni uh, Fain. And uh, there is a famous play written by Moliere that is called uh, Le Misanthrope. Huh? You can see under this picture, uh, Le Misanthrope is, of course, fr in French. Huh? Moliere is a French playwright in 17th century. And the word that is opposite to uh, to that word we just read is philanthropic. You would see this word a hundred more times than the other word, which is misanthropic. Philanthropic uh, is what we use to describe people like Bill Gates, maybe Bill Gates before the, the divorce. Uh, a person who did a lot of charity work, uh, he did good work, he treated people well, who is kind and warm and peaceful. We use this word philanthropic. So that's the opposite. Uh, this word obscene, I said it has a sexual meaning in a non-sexual circumstance when we encounter this word, which is in that uh, the sound that we heard by Eric Bogle uh, about uh, no man's land. It, he asked uh, the soldier, the dead soldier, he was talking to the dead soldier in the grave. Uh, mm, McBride, yeah, okay. And he asked, did you have a quick, quick and clean death or is your death obscene? Okay, so when you say your death obscene, it's really a very strong word because it means sexually odd or weird or deviant. So when you use that sexual word to describe a person who was killed in battle, you really mean that his death was very violent. Maybe he was torn into pieces, blood everywhere, and they're very... Uh, just very bad for you to look at. That's why you use the word obscene, which is not usually a, a right word to, to describe unless you really want the word to hit people in the face, okay? And then he asked this, uh, the dead person in the grave, he said, uh, did you leave behind a wife or a loved a girlfriend who still have you in their heart enshrined. Uh, enshrined is put up a pie way so that they could go worship it all the time or every day. Uh, many people I know, for example, Chinese or even Christians in other country, they would have a shrine in their own house where they would go say a prayer every day. And the verb to say put up a shrine is to enshrine. That is to put up a shrine where you could go worship or pay respect to. Huh? And in case of Japanese, they would have a Shinto shrine. Uh, Shinto is the Japanese local religion, and they have shrine with a gingu. They have a wooden arch in front of the shrine. It's, for example, Meiji gingu or something. That's a shen she, huh? And uh, he, I mean, Eric Bogle again, he asked, uh, did people pay no care? They, they just forget about you after you die. They are indifference about your life or death. Uh, this is called indifference. They don't have that in their mind. They're caring about other things. That's what's called indifference. And the butcher, huh? people are indifferent to the butcher and the plunder. 
and the die them uh, to condemn something. This them can be a verb and it can be a noun. And then we have this bagpipe, which is a Scottish or Irish musical instrument, which is a kind of wind instrument, meaning you blow it in it. And it has a bag that is filled with air. And it can, you can call it a bagpipe or bagpipes, uh, either singular or plural, it's the same word. And these are all the wind instruments. There are some that are made of, like this one, animal horn. This is a, probably an ox horn. That's very ancient, people don't use that anymore. Or these are more modern musical instruments instrument that are wind musical instruments. Some are made of metal like these. You have a, a trumpet and horn and bugle. The, those are the smaller ones. And trombone, trombone is a chanson la ba and the French horn and the tuba and gets bigger and bigger. Or you can have these three and others, which can be made of wood or plastic or some other things. Some are made of uh, metal as well. But these are uh, saxophone, clarinet, and the flute. Uh, flute can be made of many different materials. And here's the pen, pen flute. You probably have not seen it unless you went to Peru. That is a series of pipes of different lengths that you can blow. It's almost like a harmonica, which is coaching, huh? you blow from one hole to another, so it changes the pitch. And this word is moat, uh, because we saw puppies in the moat, which is the, the river that, or the lake or the water that surrounds a castle. And the last word would be fallow, which means to leave the land not tilted. You, if you don't plan anything, that land becomes fellow. And the, the action of doing that, which is putting aside a good land and then not cultivate it, is uh, the way to say it is to say it lay fellow. You lay the land fellow. That's always the verb to use. Okay. So let's go do this song, which is called That's What Friends Are For. And uh, it is said by Dion and the friends, because she and the three friends together, they send this song, which was not written by any of them and was not originally sung by any of them. They did it several years after someone else did it. Okay, L should be a small L. Okay, I'm going to stop share and we will come back to it later. And then we will share using another one. I hope it's this one. Okay. Did you hear that? Yes.
okay? Did you like it? Yes. 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 Okay. Very uh, much. Yeah, actually, it's mostly sung by Dion Warwick, but later, toward the very end, you had other voices coming in. Let me choose, uh, go back to this. Okay. So it's um, Dion and Friends. And uh, the, let me quickly go over this. There are all very simple words. And it describes, excuse me, how her feeling is toward this friend, uh, what it was when they first met, and then the, the, uh, he, he or she widened her uh, horizon and uh, uh, they are always helping each other. But this is a basic thing about friends, uh, many, many philosophers, including Confucius, uh, would like to talk about friends being so helpful to people. Uh, I never thought I'd feel this way. And as far as I'm concerned, I'm glad I got the chance to say that I do believe I love you. Uh, this is a little uh, questionable whether this love is just friends or uh, in a romantic way, but uh, we don't know. And if I should ever go away, uh, this is something I could really relate to because when I had a good friend, uh, we were always together in high school and in college. Uh, we were in the same classroom for seven, seven years. Yeah, sometimes I really hated her. And I would take the moment and see that if there's a moment I really liked her, then I want to remember that moment that I really liked her. So whenever I really hated her, I could go back to that time and remember that I really liked her. Okay, she, she addressed that kind of feeling several times. She said, if I should go away, then close your eyes and try to feel the way we do today and then Okay, so that, that's what I really can relate to. Then you keep smiling, keep shining, knowing you can always count on me. Huh? Uh, being a friend mostly means that they are supportive, whether you're happy or sad or you're in trouble, you can always count on them. That's what friends are for, for good times and bad times. Uh, I'll be on your side forevermore. So I am your friend. Uh, not only that you are my friend, but I am your friend. And this is, she remembers when they first met, immediately they loved each other. But now it's for a lot more than that feeling because it's just not that feeling of loving, but uh, through the years, that friend helped you so much. So when you look back, you would remember so much more than just the first moment you met and the, felt that love. And I thank you then for the time we're apart. Uh, this is, she's repeating this actually, I think three times. If we are ever to be separate, just close your eyes and try to remember who, how our friendship were like. Keep smiling. This got repeated again and again, and there's no hard, difficult words at all. Yeah. So that's this, the end of the story. Okay. And this song was written by Bert Bakara and the Carol Bayer Sager. And we have a picture later. And these are these two people are very well known for writing songs. Bert Bacharach would be the composer and the Carol Sager would be the lyricist. And this song was first recorded in, 18, in 1982 by Rod Stewart, who is another famous singer, but it's more better known for this version we just heard. It was three years later that Dionne Warwick, she got her friends, Elton John 
Gladys Knight and Stevie Wonder. Together, they made this, uh, here we say, a cover version, which means it's not their own. It's not an originally their song, but they took it from other people and they did that. That's called a cover. And this recording, uh, billed as being by Dion and friends, were released as a charity single for AIDS research and prevention. So together they did this song and uh, published it as a single, which means this record contains only one song. And they saw this as a charity. All the proceeds should go to AIDS research and the prevention. And they did a great job. It became a runaway hit. Uh, it was a massive hit, becoming the number one single in, in 1986 in the United States and winning the Grammy Awards. It raised over $3 million for that cause. So here's a picture of that record. It's a little square one uh, with the title and all the people, the names, the singer's name. But on this side, at least you don't see the composer and the lyricist's name. And you have Gladys Knight on the left and Stevie Wonder on the right. So the one in the middle is Alton John and the Dionne Warwick is in this following picture. Huh? She was born in 1940. All four people were uh, born around this time and they are all still alive. This is Alton John, 1947. Uh, he, if anything, is even more famous after Princess Diana died because he, he at the funeral, he sang the same song that he sang for Marilyn Monroe. And um, it's called The Candle in the Wind. And he is gay. And he has this lyricist as his husband, or I, I assume they were married now. And Gladys Knight was born in. 44, and she is called the Empress of Soul. When you say soul, you mean something about Black people. If she is Empress Soul, she could sing Black people's song very, very well. The reigning queen of soul music. If you go to a restaurant that sells soul food, they sell very greasy and salty food that Black people like and uh, it's tasty, but not good for your your health. Okay, and uh, there used to be a TV uh, program called the Soul Train. That is all story or things about black people. Of course, it's no longer existing now. And this is the last of them, Stevie Wonder, who is blind, uh, along with Ray Charles. They were two outstanding black musicians or singers. Uh, they also play instruments and may, may or may not write songs. I'm not familiar with that. And he's the youngest of them all, of the four. The oldest would be Dion Warwick, 10 years older. Okay, then as I promised, I'm showing you a picture of Bert Bakra and the Carol Bayer or Bayer Sager or Sager. Okay, and uh, they were married in 1982 to 1991, and it's like a match made in heaven uh, of composer and the lyricist. However, before they were married, uh, this Carol was married to Marvin Hamlish. Okay, so that's another outstanding uh, composer, Marvin Hamlish on the left-hand side. And the uh, Carol Bajer was on the right-hand side. And together they did a lot of songs. One very famous one is called We Are Playing Our Song. It's a Broadway musical. It's loosely based on their lives, 
how a composer and the lyricist living together in love would behave like when they go to a restaurant, they would listen to the songs that are playing and see if one of their songs came up first and they were competitive uh, in kind of a rebel, rival, rivalry uh, because uh, they each want to feel good about their work. Okay? Uh, but of course they, they are to, not together after that. And she married another composer who was Bert Bach Bakra. Okay, uh, that's life. Most people we heard of uh, are married at least three times. So we come to the last one, which is Chun Ri Yi Li Bai. Okay, some people say Li Bo. I think in the past, most people would say Li Bo instead of Li Bai. And this is a uh, Du Fu wrote this so Wu Lu Ha Wu Yan Lu Shi. Each line has five words, and the middle two couplets would be opposite each word. Each each word would be opposite to each other, huh? such as Kai Fu, Dui Chan Jun. Those are both people's uh, positions, their official rank name, and they would be perfect as a, a couplet. And you have Wei Bei, Jiang Dong, and so on. Huh? So in this poem, he said, Bai Ye Shu Di, uh, he, he thinks of Li Bai, oh, he, he writes the best uh, poems in the world. Nobody can, can compete with him. Piao Ran Si Bu Qun, huh? His thoughts were so eloquent and uh, elegant and uh, so unusually good. Uh, he was so fresh like Yu Kaifu. Uh, Yu Kaifu is Yu Xin. Uh, I had the names underneath. He talked about Yu Xin and the Bao Zhao. I wonder why my phone is giving me all those notifications. It never did. Uh, I don't know. Anyway, I'll try to fix that. And uh, Yu Xin is so refreshingly good when he writes poems. On the other hand, Bao Zhao is so elegant and uh, handsome and galloping, like Bao Zhao, uh, Bao Sanjin. Those are their titles while they were working for the government. And the Chinese has a tradition of using their official position to substitute their first name. So you have Yu Kaifu and the Bao Sanjin, and you have many others, of course, and like Du Fu himself, you have Du Gongbu, yeah. He was uh, an official in many, many small roles, small positions. The highest one was Gongbu, so people call him Du Gongbu. Huh? Uh, wei, wei Bei Chun Tian Shu Jiang Dong Ri Mu Yun, that is, whatever I lay my eye on, I think of him. I think of him when we were together in the springtime, the trees we saw uh, in north of Weihe, uh, Wei, Wei Shui is in Chang'an, and Jiangdong Rimuyin. And later we went to Jiangdong. Uh, he actually traveled with Li Bai for a number of months together. And so we were in Jiangdong and when I saw the sunset and the cloud, I think of him. Whatever I see that is beautiful. It reminds me of him. When could I be back together drinking from the same pot of or same goblet of wine and to engage in very long discussion in detail about literature? This is a very simple poem that is immensely popular. And every time people think of Li Bai and Du Fu, this would be the first one that came up because it is beautifully written. It's about a friendship that's everlasting and the feeling he had with Li Bai. And Li Bai being so eminently famous, we love to know that he was adored by other people. And adored he was by Du Fu. Huh? Uh, 
the other way, not so much. Levi did not adore Dufu, but Dufu really adored Levi. He was head over heel over him. And there are many good reasons. Levi was born in 701 and died in 762, 762 so about 61 years. And Dufu died when he was like 58. So they were about the same age when he died, but it was 10 years apart because the Levi was born 10 years below, or you can say 11 years before Dufu. And he died eight years before Dufu, okay? So to begin with, Levi became world famous all over. Everyone adored him when Dufu met him. Levi was 44 years old and Dufu was 33. And until Dufu died, he never got famous. He was a working poem, very hardworking poet, uh, writing lots and lots, of, maybe more than Levi did, but he did not have that talent. And he was very, very, he had such hard work, hard, hard life, so that his poems were not enjoyed by wide group of people. When he died, even as late as the end of Tang Dynasty, he was not famous, but his fame grew later on. In Ming Chao Qingchou, people liked his poem more and more. So he did not die knowing that he would be world famous. He thought he was just a pretty little poet uh, following the by as his fans, uh, as his fan, fans, okay. So when they met, Li Bai was world famous and Du Fu was not famous for the rest of his life. And they became very good friends and they drink together and they talk together and Li Bai, uh, Du Fu zi ci dui Li Bai yi jian qing xing. Uh, for that, we would say he was head over head. Uh, sorry, I can't find my cursor, okay. So he was head, over heel, uh, which means that uh, you want to hug him, you want to kiss him, you would even fall over because your head was ahead of your heels. Okay, there's a S here. Okay, head over heels means you Okay, and the next year they had a plan and they did go on a trip to Yanzhou to visit a, a Yin Shi, huh, a recluse. You probably don't need to know the word recluse, which means a hermit huh, or hermit. So they went together on a trip to visit Fan Yin Shi. And that's the last time they saw each other. So they saw each other two times. But each time was for a pretty long time, like several months or at least for many days. So this, these are the two times they saw each other. And after that, Du Fu wrote many, many, many poems thinking about Li Bai. There are 40 poems that he wrote that mentioned Li Bai and at least 15 of them he explicitly say, this is for Li Bai. So there are 15 of them. On the other hand, Li Bai, who was also on the trip with Du Fu, also wrote Yan Zhou Xing, and he did not mention Du Fu at all. That's kind of put off, huh? So you would imagine that Du Fu was nothing in his mind on his mind or in his mind, you can say either way. However, Levi did write some poems and I would show you later the two poems, the only two poems he wrote. And he really addressed Du Fu and was respectful. And he showed a lot of love for Du Fu. So it's not a one way street, but you can imagine when this star poet that everyone adores, met you and talk to you and drink together with you, how do you feel 
feel for the rest of his life and how head of head over heels he was every time he think of Levi. Huh? You could not say that uh, it's a one-sided friendship because it was not uh, even kill to begin with. Uh, so the second one of Meng Libai, less, uh, well, <laughs> actually it's his first one. He wrote two Meng Libai. The first one we just read was uh, Chun Yi Libai. And uh, uh, two, he wrote two Meng Libais and two, uh, another thing. <laughs> okay, we'll, we'll read about, we'll, we'll read all of those. Uh, gradually, huh? This one is the first poem of Meng Libai. It says, uh, okay, the other two is Yi Libai. Okay, this is Meng Libai. He actually dreamed or dreamed. You can say dreamed, uh, e -D, or you can say dreamt, D-R-E-A-M-T. -E -E both are correct when you say dreamed or dreamt, dreamt. Uh, this, uh, uh, my father also taught me to recite this, so it's uh, a more famous one than the following ones. 死别已吞生,生别长测测,江南仗立地,逐客无消息. This is when Li Bai was exiled by the court. Uh, why was he exiled? The court, everyone loved him very much. However, uh, you know, the... The, girl, the boyfriend of uh, of, of Yang Guifei. Okay, the boyfriend of Yang, Yang Guifei was uh, Tang Minghua, and he was the the emperor that brought everything down. And he uh, was on the run from the capital to Sichuan. Uh, so he did not returned to be the emperor because halfway there, his son declared himself the emperor. So we had the Tang Minghua, who is, a, uh, okay, Tang Minghua is Tang Minghua, but he's no longer the emperor and his son become the, you could say became or becomes, uh, when we talk about history that actually happened, we can use past present tense all the time, okay? So this, uh, his son be became the, the emperor, but at that time, of course, more than the son were trying to become emperor and Levi bet the wrong horse, huh? We say that he betted the wrong horse. We mean that he was helping or self supporting, bet the wrong horse, huh? It means he thought the other prince would become the emperor. So he was supporting his doing work under that prince who was named Yong Wang. Huh? And of course, when Su, Su Zong, the, the one who actually became the emperor, did not like anyone who supported any of his rivals. So Li Bai was exiled uh, for the act that he supported Yong Wang, who, is the, who was a rival of the new emperor, okay? However, everybody loved Li Bai, so he did not actually get there, which is uh, Ye Lang, which is Guizhou at that time called Ye Lang. Uh, he did not actually get there and he was, uh, an amnesty was declared so he could come back. So he did not actually arrived there. But Du Fu being not there and always worrying about Li Bai, she kept dreaming of Li Bai uh, coming to him and complain about his current uh, hardship. Of course, these are all imaginary, but Du Fu was thinking about him and wrote two Meng Li Bai poems uh, that shows you how, how much he was agonizing over this, this uh, situation. Uh, so he was thinking about Li Bai, it, you might die and I would cry, uh, but you were still alive, I believe. And I just worried, no end, I was so worried. And you're going to this Jiangnan Zhang Li Di, that's where there 
are the diseases like malaria and the yellow fever, uh, such hot weather diseases. We do not know the reason, and we say that place is jinked or cursed. So we say those places were zhangliti. They were infested with all kinds of uh, fatal diseases that we have no names for. And uh, we don't know about malaria or about yellow fever until very, very late. So uh, don't blame Levi or Dufu for not knowing uh, about these diseases. And there's no message from the exiled Ke, just a guest or visitor. So Li Bai would be a Zhu Ke. He was a guest who was banished to a faraway place, and we heard no message from him. My good friend Li Bai. Now he, he already named Li Bai in the title of the poem, and now he calls me by Guren because he's my old friend. He came into my dream uh, because he knows that I always thought about him. Huh? He clearly knows I am longing to meet him. I, my thoughts were all filled with his memories. Uh, that's why he came to my dream. It's either Li Bai came to your dream or you had Li Bai in your dream, regardless of how he what he knows huh? I'm really afraid that you probably died and your spirit came to me and is you're you were so far away traveling from Guizhou all the way to where I am Lu huh? I don't know where he was may probably in Henan or Shanxi or in Sichuan already uh, we have this uh, YouTube video about where Du Fu visited. If you want the link, I can give to you. Uh, the map would just show him moving here and there and there and there. And there's an ongoing mileage counter at the bottom. He probably did thousands, tens of thousands of miles in his life. He was just someone who were forced to travel a lot because of the chaotic situation. Okay, so, uh, so he doesn't know if Levi came to his dreams because he died or not. And the, when the spirit or the specter comes, the the maple woods would become green. And when the spirit left, the mountain passes become dark that's all out of his imagination and now the day nowadays you are uh, in prison how come you have the wings to travel so far of course he didn't this is a very much longer poem he would just say one thing and progressing to another stage and so on and when all that emotional uh, lines went he would saw at last that the, uh, the moon was uh, setting and the moonlight was inside the house you know, because of when the moon is low the, the light would shine into your house huh? uh, and uh, I would I suspect that maybe you were somewhere and the, the image was flicked flickering and I suspect that I saw you there and I was afraid that, afraid that you being so far away with all that water and waves and the rivers and lakes in between us don't please be careful don't let the dragons hidden dragons in the pools get you okay this is a very emotional poem and it's vivid and full of feelings. Okay. But this is the second one. We're not going to go over all of them, but this one is very famous for the two lines that I highlighted in red, which is Guan Gai Man Jinghua Si Ren Du Qiao Cui. This is that 
for three days in the row, he had a dream of Levi. So he really worried about him. Uh, maybe he was uh, riding on a ferry boat and fell into the water or whatever. He just imagined a lot of things. But in the end, he said, if you really had died, then you can be assured that you have a long lasting fame forever and ever, even though you're very lonely. Okay. And the next one is when they were traveling together uh, to visit Fan Yin Shi. Here we have Li Shi Er Bai and Fan Shi Yin Shi. That is when a grandfather would have many grandsons and they would count one after another and Li Bai would be the 12th grandson of his grandfather. On the other hand, Fan Yin Shi is the 10th. And if you look at my name, my name is Wang Jiu, and I am my grandfather's ninth grandchild. But this time we counted boys and girls together. In the past, I'm sure they only counted boys. But my father decided that my grandfather should count girls too. So uh, my name became Wang Jiu. Okay. And here, he immediately said, Li Ho Yu Jia Ju. That means uh, Li Bai is the person I'm talking about. Okay. And he praised him and he says, We were such good friends, like brothers. And there are two lines that people nowadays, particularly, are, interest, are interested in. These lines are highlighted in red and they read, that is a, a perfect couplet. And uh, it seemed to say that in the night, on a cool night, it's in the autumn, huh? in autumn, we share our quilt or comforter together. Immediately, a modern person would think, ooh, ooh. That must be a, some kind of a homosexual act, but uh, you can't say that. Huh? In the past, uh, people just don't talk about homosexuality, whether positively or negatively. It's just not what they want to talk about. If they really engaged in such act, they would never say that in their poems. So don't, uh, I would say banish that thought, huh? forget about that. They were good friends, that's all that he said. Okay, and then he praised him by relating to Ju uh, Song, which is Chu and the Shu, huh? that shows that uh, he thinks Li Bai has, uh, his integrity is without uh, dispute. He's such a good person and that he was, uh, very looking at the greater things instead of uh, thinking about uh, uh, name and then money. Uh, this is the, this line is about Shei Yi Tao Chun Geng. This is a there was a, an official. He was in the capital working very hard, and when the uh, when spring breeze came, he looked at that and he said. To hell with this job. I don't want to work here anymore. I want to go home and eat my favorite food, which is chun cai tang and uh, yu, yu hui geng. Okay. So this person is called Zhang Ji Ying. Huh? We, we saw many poems relate to his act about chun and the geng because this is people who are concerned more than the important, more the more in the important things in life instead of your petty job or fame. Huh. And here we have Zhen and Hu. They are they both mean the, an official dressed in the official garment, carrying this wooden. Uh, how do you call that? Hu is a, a wooden stick, uh, short stick, okay? So then we see this one is a uh, Huai Li Bai, he has two Huai Li Bai, huh? 
Dong Ri Huai Li Bai. And uh, you have other, another one I show later. Oh, okay, I don't show that. Okay, so we're not going to read this one, but we're going to read Bu Jian, which is uh, Bu Jian Li Sheng Jiu. Uh, that is because Li Bai was exiled because he was supporting the, the prince who would be king or emperor, but failed. Uh, and the many people in court, oh, think Li Bai, oh, we don't want to have anything to do with him. He's supporting the loser and he's bad, he's uh, treasonous. But even under such situation, Du Fu still right and still aired his view that Li Bai is a good person. Everyone wants to kill him, but I care about his talent. I still love him and I praise him. And I hope someday that we will be together. Uh, this is what Bu Jian is about. That means he support the person who's a, who was banished by the emperor. And then we have two poems written by Li Bai. Huh? One is uh, this one. Uh, he, he mentioned that Fei Peng Ge Zi Yuan Qie Jin Shou Zhong Bei, which means I still miss Du Fu so much. And we are traveling apart. We went different ways like Fei Peng, and uh, we still wish to get together to, to drink some wine together. Uh, this is the same sentiment that uh, Du Fu had. And when you say Fei Peng, this is uh, the tumbleweed in American language. That is a, a kind of weed that dries up and forms a ball. And when the wind blows, you would just see this tumbleweed, tumbleweed as balls of a plant rolling across the desert or someplace. And uh, as I remember when I saw the movie In Cold Blood, in the beginning, it was the farm family in the remote place. When a murder took place, the two criminals came and killed the, the two people, the whole family, actually. And uh, the movie opens with the vast, wild, open space with tumbleweed rolling along. The, because I've never seen anything like that. I saw that when I was in college and that gave me a very deep impression. And the last one is Li Bai, who uh, the second poem he wrote. And if you look at the last two lines, this is the same sentiment you can see in Du Fu's poem when he wrote about Li Bai. Uh, I think of you, you're just like that river and you, your waves and your water so wide and grand uh, and I miss you. Yeah, it means he misses Du Fu. So from these two, you can see that he misses Du Fu even though it was a long, long time ago. Yeah, and even though some people say he, he's very cold towards Du Fu, but I don't think so. Uh, that, that's all I want to say, yeah. I'm, I spent a lot of time today talking about Li Bai and Du Fu, how people think Du Fu was head over heels toward Li Bai, but I think the feeling was mutual, but it's just because Li Bai was so much more famous and smart and talented that it would appear to later people that, uh, it was a one-sided feeling. And also I found out that Du Fu was not famous. They, they cited many po poetry collections or anthologies uh, in Tang Dynasty. They collected very few of Du Fu's poems, but the more go time goes on, the more anthologies would contain Du Fu's poems. You know, Cao Xueqin's father, Cao Yin, was in charge of the uh, making uh, the, the publication of a collection of Quan Tang Shi. Uh, uh, they collected 
probably 20,000 Tang Shi uh, and Du Fu was heavily collected in that anthology, but that was in Qing Dynasty. Uh, in Tang Dynasty, not too many people mention Du Fu or adore Du Fu. That's, a, that's just a fact. Okay. Uh, I hope you learned something today. And uh, uh, as I want to repeat, you, would, you could always learn something new. Even if I'm a bad speaker, you could learn either Chinese or English or something about history or about plant or whatever it is. Yeah. As long as you learn something, you can be happy and you can come back to it. Okay. Thank you. Let me just close this. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. I would stop the share. Thank you. Thank yeah. You. Okay. <laughs> See you next time. Thank you. If uh, I have a question, I'll email you. It's okay. okay. It's yeah, still it's kind of late. Okay. Yeah, it's kind of late. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Bye. Yeah. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.